All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Palliative Care Echo Clinic. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we will start off with introductions of everybody that we have here in the room and our other hub team member who's joining us remotely. And then we'll go out to all of you, have you introduce yourselves. And then we'll get going. We've got a case from Tamisha today. Uh, and then we'll have our presentation on Nevada Pulse. So I'm Troy Jorgensen. I'm the program manager here for Project Echo Nevada. Handle most of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, and if you have questions or, or run into technical issues, that sort of thing, I'm your guy. Well, Mary Ann Brown, I'm renowned director of palliative care and clinical ethics, and I'll be making the second portion of the presentation on Pulse today. Um, hi, Dr. Kelly Conright, um, palliative care echo uh, team member and uh, hospice palliative medicine physician, both at the VA and University of Nevada, Reno. Hi, Dr. Jonathan McCaleb, uh, hospice and palliative medicine physician um, and medical director for our CLC at the Reno VA. All right. Um, Stanko, could you put up the video and just make sure that's paused? It is paused. I can, we can hear the music though. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm uh, Patty Polina. I'm a nurse practitioner with Comagine Health, and I'm also a um, board member with Polls and uh, on the advisory com uh, committee for palliative care for Nevada. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Patty. All right, I'm so we're Deborah going to... Anderson. Go ahead, I'm with Deborah. The... I'm sorry, what? Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I'm with, I'm a registered nurse and I'm with the ATOP program in Nevada. And I, when I was working the floor, I'd love the end of life care. And so I have a real uh, infinity towards palliative care and hospice care. Oh, welcome. Thanks, Deborah. Great to have you today. Uh, we'll go to Tamisha, our case presenter for the day. Hi, I'm Tamisha. I'm a nurse practitioner working in Eureka, Nevada. Hi, great to have you. Uh, sorry, Alan, we skipped over you, our other uh, technical support person out in Elko. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, oh, excuse me. Alan Fisk, I mean Elko, technical support. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Miriam, you're next. We'll unmute you if you could introduce yourself, please. Uh, Miriam Volpen. I'm uh, RN uh, Quality uh, Assurance for Eden Health, Hospice. Thanks, Miriam. Good to have you with us today. Um, I believe it's Samantha Gar. Are you there? Do we have audio for you today? Yeah. Hi. So hi. I'm a nurse practitioner in Las Vegas with the ATEL program, and also Beth, if you can see her. Beth Bedwood. Both of us with ATOP. Thank you. Hi there, good to have you. Thanks. Next, we'll go to uh, Shannon uh, Liebfried. Uh, no, I haven't. This is Shannon. I am the RN case manager at Humboldt General Hospital in Winnemucca. Um, I'm fairly new at this, so I just thought I'd join and see what I could learn. Wonderful. Good to have you today, Shannon. Thanks for being here. Next is S. Walker. It looks like you're joined by telephone. We'll unmute you. Go ahead. Yeah, my name's Stephanie. Sorry. I am um, a pharmacist at Community Health Alliance. I'm as well new to this, so I'm just kind of calling in to figure this whole thing out. Excellent. Good to have you today. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Seely. S-C-Y-L-I. We'll unmute you. Please introduce yourself. Looks like you're joined by telephone, so you might have another mute button you'll need to hit. Hi, this is Seely. I'm new at this as well, and I'm here with Victoria. All and right. Jill Sorry, where are you based? Uh, South Line Medical Center. Great. And you're there with Victoria as well, you said? And Jalissa. <coughs> Wonderful. Good to have you all joining us today. Thank you. Yeah. Next, we'll go to Dr. David Bayen. Oh, hi, I'm uh, David Bian. I'm a hospitalist at both the VA and the Neely. Thanks, Dr. Bian. Always good to have you. Next is uh, Lindsay. Hi, this is uh, Lindsay and Dr. Folks from the VA in Reno. Great, good to have you both joining us today. Thank you. And last is Kelsey Maxim. Could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, this is Kelsey Maxim. I'm a pharmacist actually with Community Health Alliance, 
and I am joined with my um, coworker, Jennifer Wheeler. Wonderful, good to have you all joining us today. So lots of new folks joining, so glad to have you all. Um, um, and I did see another question come in uh, asking about the post form itself for it to be considered legal to both sides need to be completed. And that's a perfect segue into our presentation for today. So we'll get going uh, with Mary Ann and Patty. Okay, hello. Um, we got some beginning slides here. Yeah, so just a quick disclaimer that we do record all of these sessions. We do trim out um, the case presentation portion, so any you know considerations there you don't have to worry about. But if you don't want to be on video, let us know and we can edit you out. And then Tamisha did a great job today of, of not disclosing any protected health information during your case. So we'll get going here. So that Patty can start. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, and um, I'm a, as I said previously, I'm a nurse practitioner. I work for Comagine Health with their ATOP program, but I'm also involved in Nevada Post and uh, um, Quality of Life Advisory Council and Palliative Care. Next slide, please. Perfect, here we are. Um, so we're going to, for learning ob objectives, we're going to review the Nevada Pulse document. Uh, the documents vary a little bit from state to state. Um, and we're going to talk about the type of patient that is appropriate for a Pulse document provider order for life-sustaining treatment, and we've already done a little bit of that. Um, we're going to talk about some communication tools. Um, some housekeeping about where to get forms, uh, completing the Pulse form, and understanding uh, the Pulse document. Next slide, please. Uh, so Pulse discussions can, can be by a palliative care provider, but that's not always practical. If there's not enough of us around, uh, a generalist, um, a primary care provider are, are perfect, perfectly capable of doing this as our specialist, oncologist, whoever's working uh, with the patient. And the important thing is that it is shared decision making. And, and uh, Tamika um, gave an example of this, of communicating with her patient what is important with her patient. It is an actionable medical order. And in, in Nevada, it can be signed by a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant, whoever is working with and knows that patient. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in comparison with the advanced directive, um, and it's uh, an advanced directive is for any adult 18 and older, and it's the good thing about the, the advanced directive is that it talks about healthcare preferences and a healthcare proxy. It's very useful to have a healthcare proxy. Um, it does not guide emergency personnel if they come to your home and you collapse. They will revive you. The Pulse document is, is for somebody with a serious illness at any age, um, but someone in frail health. And it, it does guide actions by emergency personnel. It's a, it's a bright pink document that's it's prominently placed in. Uh, it guides what uh, the emergency services need to follow. Next slide, please. So here's an example of the big pink form. You can use an electronic copy. We recommend pink because it's easy to see. You can post it at the bedside. If they're in the home, you can put it on the refrigerator, wherever, um, wherever it can be seen really easily. And, and Marion and, uh, later on is going to talk about filling out the form as well. Um, next slide. So this is an algorithm, and it basically goes through the, the lifespan and the health, uh, the health trajectory. Um, complete the advanced directive. We, we recommend that for everybody. It's it's so important, and it and some of that information is used on the Pulse form as well. Then you don't get into a situation where you do become very ill and you lose capacity and you don't have a healthcare proxy. Um, it's it's so important to have a healthcare proxy. Um, 
So um, with an advanced illness, uh, and we mentioned the surprise question, I'll mention that again, that is a good time to have a pulsed form. Uh, and, and it is, um, uh, it's not mandatory. An advanced directive and a pulse form, those are voluntary. The patient has to agree. Um, conversations take place throughout the, um, the life cycle, the life uh, span. Uh, next slide, please. So in Nevada, um, the first legislation was passed in 2013, and then it was revised in uh, 2017, um, and th the form was updated and included a capacity determination, which any provider can make. That's not competency. That means that the patient understands what they're deciding. Um, and also, uh, it revise that any provider, nurse practitioner, physician, or PA could sign the form. The Nevada Pulse nonprofit was established in 2014, even though it had been worked on previously for many years um, by a group of stakeholders. Um, so the nonprofit uh, upholds national Pulse standards. Um, we have uh, the web address um, down here, and it is a, it's a great resource. It's very thorough. It even talks about end of life conversations. It goes into all kinds of detail and answers all kinds of questions. Plus, it has educational opportunities that um, providers, nurses, any, any health workers can sign up for. Uh, next slide, please. So um, who's appropriate for the polls? Um, like it was mentioned earlier, I mentioned the surprise question. And I also really like that tool we used earlier. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so it's for the medically frail and the very ill. And uh, also uh, patients with early stage dementia may want to consider a pulse document. It, it, it is voluntary, but it, it is, um, useful to make those decisions while you still can. So there's a number of really good communication tools out there, and I, I'm, I'm gonna mention just a couple. I like Ask, Tell, Ask because it's easy, it's easy to remember. And it's, it's good for any difficult conversation because it reminds you to not get ahead of yourself. Um, what do you know? What do you want to know? And you may find out that they need to have somebody with them during this conversation. It's, uh, it's collaborative. Um, it, you find out the, uh, the patient's expectations. Um, you give information in lay language and you make sure they understand. What did I, do you understand what I just told you? Or what, what, what did I just, you wanna say it in a really friendly way. Um, can you say in your own words what was explained to you? Next slide, please. <clears throat> I like spikes. Um, I like it for individuals, but I also like it for family meetings. Um, it, it just keeps you um, organized. And it includes the ask, tell, ask as well. Um, sitting down can get really tricky, especially in a hospital room. I remember always having to move the laundry. Um, but it's important to uh, make sure that you're engaged. So you're either at a table with everybody or you're at the bedside sitting down, hopefully. Um, you wanna find out the viewpoint of the, and I keep saying have resident on here, but I mean patient, but I work with a lot of long-term care residents. So that's how that popped up. Um, you wanna find the, the viewpoint of the patient or the family. So you wanna use open-ended questions with them. Invitation, what do you want to know? Um, you want to speak in lay language, and you want to give people time to react to what you're telling them, adjust, um, digest. So give people time. You may have to come back and visit again, but very often you need to. Um, S is for summary, so you can summarize where you're at at this time. Some people write, write it down on a piece of paper. Some providers do that. And just to kind of as a, as a, a, a reminder um, for the next meeting. 
uh, next slide. <clears throat> Cultural and spiritual assessment. Um, it can be really important and sometimes another team, depending who you work with, another team member might do that for you, but it's fairly simple. You can just ask, how do you keep up your spirits? Um, they will usually, if they have a specific uh, church, they will usually bring that up. Um, they may have a pastor they're attached to that need they get support from. They may ask for a chaplain if you have availability to one. Um, do you have any special beliefs about health and illness? And those vary so much in different cultures. It's really useful to find those things out. I've often found those things out when I've used a, a, a medical interpreter for different languages. Um, I've, I've found that, that very useful, that's necessary, but I've gotten very inf interesting information that way um, with a good inter um, medical interpreter. Um, and then have you had any experience with serious illness in your family? They'll often talk about that. You can learn an awful lot. Um, from their previous experiences. So I'm going to let Mary Ann take over uh, with this case study. Well, good afternoon. As I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, Mary Ann Brown. I'm a nurse uh, and I am the director of Renown's Palliative Care and also um, the director of our clinical ethics program. So I very much enjoyed the discussion and the case study earlier on. This case study won't be as interesting or robust, I think, because yours was so much better because it was a, a real life patient. But I spend a lot, a majority of my time doing advanced care planning and having those conversations with seriously ill patients. So um, let's, get, let's get down to the case. So this is a 69 year old gentleman with a history of head and neck cancer that has some chronic wounds. Um, he had a gastrostomy tube that was removed due to infection. Um, he's been on a trial to see if he can take enough um, in orally so that he doesn't have to have the uh, gastrostomy tube replaced, but he's really not able to eat enough um, nutrition, and he's already lost a significant amount of weight, um, eight pounds in two weeks. Um, his comorbidities are diabetes, hypertension, GERD, anemia, insomnia, the cellulitis of his abdominal wall, and then those wounds. Um, and failure to thrive and chronic kidney disease. He really keeps to himself um, in his room or in his bed. Um, his how What he likes to do is watch TV. He is alert and oriented. Um, he's able to make his choices and preference, preferences known. According to the nurses that care for him, he really doesn't want the gastrostomy to be placed. And he's really not interested in other types of artificial nutrition and just prefers to eat as much or as little as he wants. His daughter has arrived from out of, the, out of state and is really urging him to have an NG tube until he can have that gastrostomy tube replaced. I need to help her with my clicker. Oh, I don't know why it switched over. There we go. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so here's some uh, medical information. You can see his, anti uh, his antibiotics and medications listed um, and his lab values and vital signs. He does already have a pulse form in his chart that um, he has selected full treatment and also um, to prolong his life by all medically effective means and nothing is checked under the artificial nutrition and fluid section. He also does not have an advanced directive. So this would actually be his filled out post form. And so we'll go through this to um, the various sections that you would find in a post form. Um, it starts with the basic demographics and patient identifiers. So you're gonna put the patient's, in, and this is in the right, upper right-hand corner. So you're gonna put the patient's name. Ah, there we go. Very cool. <laughs> wow, technology. So you note the patient's name and birth date, the last four of the social security, and then the gender. Then the first section of the Pulse form requires you to address code status. What is the patient's preference related to um, CPR and resuscitation? And in this case, um, this patient chose attempt resuscitation, which would be a full code. And then the <coughs> section B is related to medical interventions and the goals of care for this patient. In this case, the patient selected full treatment, 
which is to uh, making the goal to pr prolong his life by all medically effective means. So uh, this would be ICU care, intubation, mechanical ventilation, advanced airways, et cetera. The other two options that you have when completing a pulse form are selective treatments, um, which really is a hybrid between full treatment and comfort and says, I really don't want to be intubated uh, or have it, um, but I would be interested in advanced airways. Um, you may use um, CPAP and the patient may be appropriate for a hospital transfer. In general, the patient that select, selects selective treatment is not really interested in ICU, but certainly that might be needed uh, based on some of those um, interventions that are acceptable. The third option is to select comfort-focused treatment, which really means that all um, care will be focused on the management of pain and symptom um, by medication of any route. Sometimes oxygen is used because oxygen can be a comfort and appropriate comfort measure for some patients. And then only those, uh, no advanced airways, but certainly um, you can suction for airway uh, obstruction. And this patient would only be transferred to the hospital if you were unable to make them comfortable in their current setting. So comfort-focused treatment is really appropriate for those patients also who are on hospice. Um, the goal for hospice, patients on hospice is for them to remain in their home with the only exception being if uh, pain and symptoms cannot be managed at home. The next section, which this gentleman did not complete, and it's the section probably of some interest in this case, is artificial nutrition and fluids. So you have an option to select that um, long-term artificial nutrition and tube feedings are acceptable, and then you can also note if it's not, um, or if you're interested in a trial. The next section, which we did add, I have to say that I spent, I was one of those people pushing for polls for almost probably about 17 years before it actually went to the legislature. So really uh, very proud and very happy that our state now has uh, pulse forms. And in my own practice and experience, I've seen the promotion and the advancement of the use of pulse forms in our state. And it's, it's very gratifying because again, it allows patients to receive care of their choice in line with their values. So it's a very effective tool in um, assuring the care we're providing for, for patients is really what they want. So the determining capacity, um, the provider would um, ask those questions of the patient to determine that they have capacity in terms of their orient, are they oriented? Do they understand the questions being posed, proposed to them? Do they understand their clinical condition enough to deliberate and then make, make a decision? And if that's the case, then this patient would, uh, you would select that the patient has capacity. In order for the pulse form to be valid, signatures are required. And this next section identifies that the provider, uh, the provider must sign. So in this section, you would date it, sign it. Um, you would also put your license number and then print your name and phone number. It's really important that all of that be filled out, especially because sometimes it's very difficult to read signatures. So if you don't print your name, oftentimes we don't know who has completed the form. If in fact, for example, we want to have a conversation with the provider that had that conversation with the patient and, and completed the pulse form. Then the next section is for the patient, agent, parent, or legal guardian to sign. So this is the other required signature. In order for a pulse form to be valid, you have to have a provider signature and you have to have either a patient or a representative of the patient's signature. And so if the patient has capacity, you would see that the patient um, circled, and which was not done on this form. So we, uh, and I think I was the one who was supposed to have completed it. So I would circle patient, and then I would have the patient sign, print their name, and date it. Next slide. Yeah, I guess it's, there we go. Yeah. Wow, cool. this is so cool. <laughs> so the back of the form, if we look at page two or side two, um, the uh, section A requires you to fill out if the patient has an advanced directive. Now the critical thing about this is it, the advanced directive, you have to actually have seen it either uh, in your hand or um, an electronic copy. Because oftentimes if you ask a patient if they have an advanced directive, they will say yes. Um, but oftentimes they might have a durable power uh, for finance or some other type of document 
or they might assume that they have an advanced directive because they want their significant other to make decisions. So I only um, select yes if the patient actually has an advanced directive. In this case, the patient does not, so you would say no. If the patient did have an advanced directive, you would want to note the agent that's written in that document and then any alternates and their phone numbers. Because again, if the patient were to lose capacity, then you would have that information at hand on who to talk to. Also, if the agent had signed the POLS form because the patient lacked capacity, you would want to identify that they are in fact the agent noted in the patient's advance directive. Also, if the patient has a court appointed guardian, guardians can sign POLS forms. You would want to note that the patient had a guardian in the name and phone number. Um, Unfortunately, even though the law allows guardians to sign POLS forms, it's my experience that um, particularly in some counties, guardians are prohibited from signing POLS forms. So um, that presents uh, a challenge for those of us, particularly in the acute setting when we are trying to uh, do advanced care planning and address end of life um, plans. So if the patient had a guardian, the guardian could sign and you would note yes. If in fact the patient doesn't have an advanced directive noting an agent, they don't have a guardian, and they lack capacity, then you can, in the, the next um, line of representatives that can sign are healthcare surrogates. One of the nicest things about the POLS form is on the back, if you forget um, the ranking of next to kin who can sign the POLS form, it's listed under completing a POLS, and the order is listed there. A spouse, the majority of adult children, parents, a majority of adult siblings, um, the nearest other adult relative of the patient by blood or adoption who's reasonably available, and then my personal favorite um, coming from the acute care environment, an adult who has exhibited special care or concern for the patient, who is familiar with the values of the patient and willing and able to make health care decisions for the patient. Um, as the ethics consultant uh, and, and the director of the ethics committee at Renown, I see a great deal of my consultations are related to unrepresented patients. So this becomes very helpful when we have patients who have no family and we are, um, again, trying to do advanced care planning and do end of life care um, planning. So this allows us to talk to um, individuals who uh, understand the patient's values and are willing to make decisions. There's then a, a section where the preparer writes their name and, and their title. Um, you would know whether or not the, the POLS is uh, part of the registry, which in Nevada is Nevada Lockbox, and then also their organ donation status. And again, very helpful instructions on the back of the form if you forget any, uh, any key parts of completing a POLS. Troy, did you want to ask that question because it was relative? Yeah, to Tamisha, did that answer your question about Section C? Uh, kind of. So, I mean, I guess there's some folks who, if they just want comfort measures, do we still have to put down that they don't want any artificial feedings? Is it necessary or can you just skip past the section C? No, I almost, I always address it because patients can choose to continue to receive artificial nutrition and hydration after all other measures have been stopped. <coughs> um, I usually try to um, explain why that might not be of value to the patient, but they really have a choice. So I always address artificial nutrition and hydration. Also because it's how our um, <coughs> statements of desire are laid out in an advanced directive. So this kind of follows that. So I think it's important to address um, artificial nutrition and hydration for all patients. Okay, but is it still valid if it's not checked? But I guess that was my question. No, so any, the, the POLS form is valid as long as you have those signatures. So the, the provider signature and the patient or their representative, and then some selection, you can leave se se sections blank, like this patient did not elect to make a designation about artificial nutrition and hydration. So the tool is still valid. It just okay. sometimes leaves questions, as in this case, we're trying to figure out what to do related to the nutritional status of the patient. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Absolutely. So how, um, and this is where you all get a chance to talk, uh, weigh in on this case. How would you start the conversation with this patient? Um, and who else might you want to be involved? We gave you a hint. 
well. I would jump in and say, you know, Patty set us up really well. You could certainly use the, um, some why questions and trying to understand the patient's choices, what, those based, what his choices are based on, um, to have further the dialogue about his goals of care and as you're uh, trying to establish a plan of care. Um, it would be very helpful um, to talk to those who are providing care to him. They know him as well. So um, getting that team approach, um, I, assume, I think that we can assume because he was staying in his room that this might be a skilled, a patient in a skilled nursing facility. So certainly um, a team conference or discussing the patient's care and plan at IDT. But go ahead. And just I'd like to add, um, who else do you want to be involved? The interdisciplinary team is good. And, and these are serious conversations and, and whenever possible for them to have whoever matters to them in the room. You know, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had. It took me a, some years of practice that you have the conversation like, can we talk about this again? I want my wife here. <laughs> so whoever's important to them, have them yeah. be and, there to help. You know, I think in this case, as we read, critical would be the daughter because she's really encouraging the patient to do something that sounds like it's really not his preference. So having, um, having her hear his perspective as you have the conversation about what's important to him and as you're identifying the goals of care for him, having her be present, present would be critical. So a question came in. Um, is it okay if only the first page is filled out and that will be accepted or does the second page need to be included? So if the second page isn't filled out, it would still be um, valid because those two signatures there, as long as something was filled in. But it's, it's really, um, again, not a complete post form. So, and, and I'm not a lawyer, um, so I don't claim to know what, how this would be legally valid. I would just say to you, the more complete you can make a post form, um, the more that it's accepted and it's, and it's appropriate. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't skip over the back page. So what other tools might be useful um, related to conversations with this patient? Any thoughts out there? Feel free to unmute yourselves. Well, so I think it, um, I think a discussion absolutely about artificial nutrition and hydration, why this individual doesn't want the G2 um, sort of bigger picture. To me, it, it sounds like this patient may be getting close to just wanting to focus on his comfort and do what he wants to do, eat and drink as much or as little as he wants. This patient on the surface uh, might actually be a good patient to talk about hospice if in fact his goal is to just despite the risks of um, aspiration from eating, he may just want to eat or the risk of um, malnutrition. Uh, so really having a good solid discussion about goals of care and then figuring out next steps after that. This patient would also benefit from an advanced directive because um, it would be important to know who he would want to make decisions if he were to lose capacity. And because his daughter is really struggling, he would want to make sure he has really good conversations with her so that she understands his values if in fact he's going to, if she's going to be his decision maker. Um, I just did a workshop, an advanced directive workshop yesterday, and I stress so much to people to be very careful about who they pick as their agent because they have a lot of power about what happens to someone at the end of life. And if they don't understand what's important to you and what your values are, they can um, move away from what really would be in line with what this patient would want. So as I was reading this case, the daughter's comments um, made me wanna make sure we have good conversations with her, that, that the patient and the daughter have good conversations together, and so that the team, the patient, and the family are all on the same page again about goals of care and what the plan of care is gonna be. Would this patient have benefited from an upstream palliative care consult? Um, absolutely, I think potentially there could have been more dialogue around um, artificial nutrition and hydration in advance and potentially involving the daughter. So any of those conversations that can be done early are very helpful. I think in listening to the introductions from all of you, 
outpatient palliative care service are very, very uh, scarce, even in um, urban settings. So we really appreciate and acknowledge primary palliative care being done by providers all over. And I would say anyone who engages in advanced care planning, pain and symptom management is really helping by providing prime, uh, uh, primary palliative care. So where would you obtain um, forms? Are there any last, we only have about six minutes left. Are there any other comments about the case study, things people would have done? Um, any insights? The only thing that I was going to comment on was, of course, um, what you had mentioned, which was having some upstream conversations prior to even the placement of the tube, because a lot of times I find it really useful to help qualify the patient's expectations of the tube and where how they see that factoring into their short-term uh, needs nutritionally, but also um, what um, the plan might be before the tube's place once those short-term needs uh, are no longer yeah. able to be met by the tube. Um, so, you know, one of the techniques that I, I use with patients a lot in these conversations when we'll, we'll get a palliative care consult before the placement of a tube is I explain it to them that, you know, a, a feeding tube is a bridge from one place to, to the next. And so if um, that does not um, end up getting you to that point, then discontinuing it would not be any different from having never started in the first place. Um, so I, I really feel like um, the primary um, the, the primary palliative care toolkit is, is so essential, but um, it, it, that can also be um, part of the discussion between the interventional radiologist um, who might be placing the tube, the gastroenterologist who might be doing that, the dietitian who um, is upstream and saying, well, this person's need, uh, nutritional needs are being met. So there's a lot of um, people upstream, uh, you know, in, inclusive of the nurses and the providers who uh, would be able to have these conversations very fluently. I, I think that's a really critical point that Dr. Michaela made is because oftentimes patients, um, if you don't have the discussion about, are you okay with never eating again or allowing this, so the bridge to getting better um, discussion and then sort of long-term what's acceptable to you. So there's some parameters around that and letting patients know that this is not permanent, that there isn't, that they're, they're allowed to say, I don't want this anymore. I think sometimes patients don't believe that they can stop a treatment once it's been initiated. And I think we have to allow for that space, for that dialogue. And it can come from multiple sources, as you mentioned, Dr. Michaela. And I just want to, to modify in a more global sense what Dr. Michaela and Miriam were talking about is we recommend, if not a palliative care consultation, a palliative care intervention, which is a simple, what are your goals for any life-sustaining treatment before it started, be it a feeding tube, be it a tracheostomy, be it in, uh, intubation, be it hemodialysis. These are all life-sustaining treatments. And many people might be agreeable to have them as a trial, but might not want them permanently. So again, it's really an important point before you get these started to talk about the bigger picture. Um, question, uh, is the patient allowed to fill out the form or does it strictly have to be the provider? So it is not something a patient can do on their own like an advanced directive. Um, it really needs to be sh a shared process with the provider. When I do my advanced directive workshops, I only give a um, sample a copy of a pulse form. I don't hand out the originals. That should really come from the provider. And it, it takes some discussion. The, so they're the ones helping make the decision. That's that shared decision-making model. But patients shouldn't be filling them out on their own. It should really be a, a collaborative process with the provider. And that comment um, being made um, about the a, a patient completed pulse just being dropped off in a physician's mailbox, yeah. um, that would be assigned to the physician to get that patient in for a visit and have a conversation prior to um, the signature on the pulse form so that they can both be on the same page. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with having your teammates who are well-trained nurses, for example, completing, having, starting the dialogue, um, and filling out 
portions of the post form, but it then must be a discussion between the patient and the provider who signs that because these are orders, these are medical orders that are being signed. Unlike an advanced directive that really can be a process driven by uh, independently by the patient, this is a process that must be in collaboration with the provider who's signing those uh, medical orders. So if you wanted to obtain pulse forms, they are available online from the Nevada Division of Public and Behavioral Health. They can also be picked up at the locations noted there. My organization um, prints them um, in bright pink uh, paper and has those available for our organization. I want to just caution people that they cannot change the form itself. The form was approved by the Nevada Board of the Board of Health for the State of Nevada, um, and so you can't change that form, add things to it. It has to be um, just the way you see it. But certainly, you can, you know, print your own. Again, bright pink um, paper is um, the is also in the statute as a requirement. As was mentioned by Patty, electronic versions, however, are legal and should be followed. Um, uh, completing the form, oh, so, so we talked, uh, no. who can complete the form? As I mentioned, you can have parts of members of your team help you um, complete them, but the provider is responsible for the content. I would avoid just signing them. Uh, you wouldn't want to have someone who had a code status that was incongruent with their medical interventions. So you really, and your comment about comfort focused treatment and tube feedings, you would want to clarify all of that. So the orders that are in the pulse form are the responsibility of the provider to make sure they're congruent. Um, again, the provider also has to determine capacity. It must be date, dated and signed. In order to, you can void a pulse form. Patients can change their mind. In both case studies, the patients may change their mind about what's contained in their pulse form. You would write void across it. Um, you could execute a new pulse form um, as the uh, treating facility. In my facility, we're going to look at the pulse form with the most current date. Next slide. Um, document management, as Patty mentioned, uh, pulse form should be displayed prominently in the home setting, on the fridge, next to the bed. Families should be aware that their pulse form is in existence. If EMS is called, they should provide the pulse form to EMS. Um, the pulse form, again, is followed wherever the patient is, the hospital, the ER, the nursing home, the patient's home. As long as that treating team has access to that pulse form, they should be following those orders. Um, there is an online lockbox where you can um, upload your advanced directives, including your post. There's a registration form. You mail that in. Um, you receive a card back in about six to eight weeks that gives a sign-on and password so those documents can be accessed electronically. Um, next slide. And this was Dr. Conrad's um, cartoon, and I've done it right on time. Uh, my, name, my name is uh, Daniel Nathan Reed. I don't initial anything. <laughs> That's particularly relevant, again, for the advanced directive where you're initialing your statements of desire. So yeah. two more questions there. We yeah, let's, okay. let's address the questions and then see if there's anything else we can uh, answer before we wrap up. So uh, we still have facilities insisting on residents completing Pulse, which is not legal, correct? Is there an ongoing education around this? Yes, so this was this was troublesome to the Pulse Board when we uh, got word of skilled nursing facilities requiring Pulse to be completed. Um, a Pulse form is voluntary. No one should be required to complete a Pulse form. And I know for a fact that coming up um, at the end of this month, we are doing a Pulse education for um, a whole bunch of skilled facility um, employees from across the state. So the Pulse, Pulse Board, um, Post or Nevada Post continues to try and offer education to all stakeholders so that they are appropriately utilizing the Post form. And in the event a provider is stating the back page is only for the patient to fill out, is there somewhere we can refer them to? Well, um, the provider or the patient? <laughs> Um, I would assume the provider. <coughs> yeah, so I certainly um, there is a lot of resources on the Nevada Post um, website. They're divided into provider and public. So there's FAQs for providers. There are webinars. There is a ton of information on there. There's current research. So I would gear any provider who has questions about Nevada Post to visit the website. 
I think in that particular instance that Celie um, mentioned, um, that that sounds a lot like a situation that we've commonly seen um, with providers where sometimes the provider um, understands the second page of the pulse to be a proxy for the advanced directive, which of course it is not. No. And so um, in those instances, um, the provider should be reminded, I think, that um, this, this portion of the post is a recitation of the advanced directive. It is not um, in a replacement substitute. of or a substitute for. That's, that's excellent. I, I, that would be very important to say. This is only asking you to look at the information on the pulse form and place it on the advanced directive and pay, place it on the pulse form. The other thing it does is it supports that that is the patient's agent that signed on the front of the form. So if you in fact circle agent, then you need to see on the back of that that the, the patient has a pulse form and that agent's name. And that is, that's critical because there's a big difference between an agent and next of kin. So um, certainly this, a pulse form does not replace an advanced directive. Any other, Fabulous questions. Yeah, any other questions we can help you with before we wrap up for today? Feel free to write those in through the chat box or unmute yourselves, please. I just, if it's okay, I have a, a closing comment. Um, we're very much uh, deeply in, have deep gratitude to both Patty and Marianne. This year in our palliative care echo, we are, we are soliciting and bringing in some incredible expertise that exists in the state so that they can share and help you learn and grow in your palliative care skills. So we um, will look forward to seeing more of the expertise in the state um, with us facilitating. And, and we also look forward to more cases. Yeah. So please, please uh, submit your case. Um, we'll be addressing um, the next case at our um, next uh, echo for the month of March and look forward to, to anything that you have to bring to us to, to share um, our knowledge and um, the expertise. Great, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. So I put a link through the chat box for you to complete uh, the CME and CEU evaluation to claim your credit. And then our next session is gonna be on Friday, March 20th. So we hope you'll join us then. Uh, we are developing an online case form that's gonna be available. So making things easier for you to submit your cases to us. So keep an eye out for that um, and have a great rest of your day and a good weekend, everybody.